With the release of a new codex for the Astra Militarum, I thought it would be a good idea to take advantage of the new miniatures accompanying it and revisit one of my previous projects. When the Death Corps of Krieg made their Kill Team debut, I modified the miniatures to represent members of the Valhallen Ice Warriors, and I wanted to continue this theme across the new miniatures. I was fortunate to receive a copy of the Cadia Stands box set from Games Workshop, and within that box is the new Sentinel. Having not tackled all that many vehicles on this channel, I thought it would be fun to try and build a Valhallen Sentinel. The build started off by removing all the parts required to build an armoured sentinel before cleaning them up with their mould lines and tabs. For the most part, the assembly was done by the book. The legs and cockpit were assembled following the usual instructions up until the armoured cockpit and weapons were about to be attached. Hailing from a frozen world and being expert in cold climate warfare, it made the most sense to construct the sentinel as its armoured version. However, in doing this, the pilots of the walker would be obscured, limiting my ability to add theming to the model. So, to fix this, I intended to have the pilot leaning out of the top hatch. The only trouble with this was that the hatch was not a separate piece, and so would need to be removed from the rest of the armour. This was done by running a sharp blade along the seam between the hatch and its surrounding, whilst only applying a light amount of pressure. The scouring technique was slow and arduous, but taking time would make this process both safer and the finished result cleaner. This process was repeated until the blade made its way all the way through the plastic and the hatch had been freed from its surroundings. Once removed, it just needed a little trimming to clean up the edge and make it a little more defined. Now that the hatch had been removed, it could be reattached in an open position. However, the inside of the hatch was a little too flat and featureless, so a little extra detail would be added. The first part of this involved some half millimeter thick plaster card, which would be added to the inside of the hatch in order to create a lip. The hatch was placed over the top of the plaster card, and this was used to cut out a piece roughly the same size. From here, the plaster card was cut back steadily until it had the same shape as the hatch, but was about a millimeter smaller the whole way around. With this done, the plaster card was glued into place, creating a slightly more realistic hatch. Following this, an Astra Militarum handle was glued to the hatch. These can be sourced from a number of different vehicle kits, including the Rus and the Bane Blade. With the hatch built, the top armor panel was glued to the cockpit's frame before the hatch was fixed in place in an open position. The rest of the armored cockpit was left separate for the time being, as it would make attaching the pilot much easier. To build the pilot, the stock torso that came with the Sentinel kit was assembled. After allowing the glue to dry, a hole was drilled into the underside. Following this, another hole was drilled down vertically into the pilot's waist found within the Sentinel's cockpit. With both holes drilled, a length of 1mm wire was superglued into the hole in the torso. The wire was then temporarily placed into the cockpit hole so the torso poked out of the hatch. The wire was a little too long at first though. But after a series of trims and comparisons, the wire eventually reached the desired length. With the shoulders above the hatch, it was ready for a pair of arms. The Sentinel pilot's original arms weren't really suitable though, as they were holding onto the controls and the arms from the new infantry sprue featured shoulder pads, which would be far too bulky to wear inside the cockpit. Fortunately, the new Field Ordnance Battery crews have arms perfect for our needs. A set of arms were picked out that created the appearance of the pilot leaning against the hull of the Sentinel, and once they'd been glued into place, the pilot's torso was removed from the Sentinel. In my previous Valhallen video, I demonstrated how to convert the Cadian helmet into the iconic Valhallen Ushanka-like hat. With the new Cadian kit comes a slightly different helmet, but fortunately this can also be modified to make an Ushanka too. But first, in order to make the small parts easier to work with, a hole was drilled into the underside of the head. By leaving the pin vise in place, it would make for a decent handle. The helmet was first modified by using clippers to remove the raised parts of the helmet from the sides and the back. From here, a scalpel was used to shave both these areas and the aquila flat. For the fur lining, some green stuff was used. After mixing up a small amount, it was then cut up into three small lumps which were placed around the face. One large piece above and two slightly smaller pieces at either side. 
These were first pressed and spread out to form the areas of fur before using the pointed end of a sculpting tool to press into a series of shallow, irregularly shaped and spaced divots. After pressing in a number of these, a fur texture began to form. Remember, using a little Vaseline here will help to prevent the putty from sticking to the tool. Once this was done, and the putty had been given sufficient time to cure, the completed Ashanka hat wearing head was then glued into place on the torso. With the pilot completed, I returned my attention to the Sentinel itself. After attaching the armoured panels of the cockpit, a few sewage items were then added to the sides. The first items were the simple containers that the Sentinel kit came with, but in order to represent Valhallan expertise in fighting greenskins, a few dead animal bits were added as well. These orc skulls were taken from the usual Citadel skulls kit. One was attached to the edge of the container, while the other had a little damage added. A bullet hole was first drilled into the cranium using a pin vise, before adding cracks around the edge with the tip of a knife. With sufficient damage added, the second skull was glued next to the first. To help balance out the modifications, a few additional armor panels would be added to the right side of the cockpit. In order to represent this applique armor, some more half millimeter plaster card was used. Two small sheets were cut out to match the size and shape of the right front side panels. Like with the hatch, small adjustments and frequent comparison makes this kind of work much easier. Once I was happy with the look of the panels, they were glued into place. However, they were looking a little too tacked on and didn't have that hasty field repair look to them. So, to create some rough weld marks, I turned to my part of sprue glue. For those unfamiliar with this concoction, it's basically a half part of Tamiya Extra Thin that has been topped up with some small chunks of sprue. The sprue melts into the glue, creating a viscous liquid that hardens into plastic once dried. This mixture was carefully painted around the edges of the armor panels, removing the step and creating more of a smoother gradient. Once done, the sprue glue was left to dry just a little bit so that it wasn't quite liquid anymore, but it still wasn't completely firm. While still malleable, a pointed sculpting tool was used to press into a series of overlapping pinpricks into the sprue glue, resulting in the appearance of a rough welding bead. With the armor panels complete, the remaining stowage and weaponry were attached to the Sentinel. The final modification came in the addition of a roll of fabric. In the cold environments that the Valhallans operate in, such material would have a multitude of uses. This would be formed from yet more green stuff which was rolled into a sausage shape before being placed behind the skulls. The putty was then smoothed out and flattened down a little using some rubber sculpting tools before a couple of straps were scoured in with a sharp tip. The straps were formed by marking out two parallel lines and then applying a little pressure so that they sagged and looked as though they were pressing into the soft material. Gradually, more folds and creases were added until I was left with a recognizable piece of rolled fabric. Once this had been cured, the model was ready to be painted. But first, let's hear a little bit about the sponsors of this video. Factor. We've all been there. You're in the middle of a project or a game. It's coming up to dinner time and you really don't want to think about cooking. But you also don't want to just order fast food again. Well, Factor has the solution for you. Factors no hassle prepared foods, make sure you always have something nutritious on hand. Grab a prepared smoothie or keto shake for a quick snack, or heat and eat a chef quality meal in just two minutes with no prep or cleanup necessary, so you can stay focused on those dice rolls. Get fresh, ready-made meals delivered to your doorstep that are ready to eat in two minutes or less. Factors chef created meals are fresh, never frozen, and designed by dietitians to ensure every meal is packed with premium, science-based nutritional quality. No more meal prep, no more dishes, no more unhealthy fast food. Factors offers the most convenient way to eat well whilst eating right. Factors meal plans offer variety with a rotating weekly menu of 27 plus meal options and 33 plus add-ons like smoothies, keto shakes, desserts, and more. Choose your favorite meals or let Factor craft your order based on your personal taste preferences and meal history. Plus, they offer seafood, veggie and meat options along with keto, calorie smart, chef's favorites and vegan options. So, if you want to try out Factor for yourself, use my link or head on over to go.factor75.com and use my code for 60% off your first box. 
A big thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video, and with that, let's get back to the miniature. The inspiration for the scheme came from one of Night Shift's recent KV2 guides, and if you're a fan of creating realistic, highly detailed scale models, then I definitely recommend checking out its channel and the video that the scheme was inspired by, both of which you can find links in the description below. So as always, the case when painting miniatures, the first step is to prime. A black airbrush primer was chosen for this, as it would give me a good starting point that I could take advantage of to create some areas of shadow later on. I wanted to give the Sentinel the appearance of having a worn down whitewash that had been applied over an original olive green. This would be created with some of Tamiya's XF58 olive green. For this first layer, I wanted a slightly darker shade, so I opted to mix in a very small amount of Liquitex ink, specifically Prussian blue hue. This dark turquoise paint was thinned out with Tamiya Thinner to create a mix that could be smoothly sprayed through my airbrush. With this first coat, the paint was focused to the lower parts of the model, effectively creating a shaded version of the later olive green. With the first coat complete, some olive green on its own was then sprayed over the model. This time, the paint was sprayed mainly from above. This was so the recessed areas particularly those beneath the cockpit, remained dark and effectively created the illusion of shadows. While applying this paint, several thin layers were applied rather than a single coat. This ensured that even coverage was preventing the finer details from becoming obscured. To continue this gradient from the darker to the lighter areas, some XF57 buff was mixed into the olive green. This retained the same green hue of the olive green whilst lightening and reducing the saturation a little. This made it perfect to focus on the naturally lighter areas, such as those on the upper facing parts of the model. Now I wouldn't worry about spending too much time on these first few base coats. Quick and rough applications are all that are needed for the time being. This green base coat will be covered over for the most part by the whitewash, with only smaller damaged areas remaining visible. Even so, it's still worth putting that effort into the gradients, as they will still show through. With the first base layers down, I could think about adding the chipping effects, but in order to protect the paint that had been applied so far, it was important to lay down an all over coat of varnish. I chose a matte varnish for this, but at this stage, it's not particularly important which one you choose. The chipping and wearing away of the whitewash would be facilitated by the application of some AK Interactive's worn effects. This fluid did not require any fluing when applied to the airbrush and was sprayed across the whole model. After the first coat had dried, a second was applied over the top. This layer would create a water-soluble barrier that would allow the next few layers of paint to be easily removed where desired. The whitewash would be created by applying several very thin layers of white paint over the armor. However, in order to create a slightly more translucent looking layer of paint, a tiny amount of the earlier olive green was mixed into some of Tamiya's XF2 flat white. This white, with a slight hint of green, was then sprayed over the entirety of the Sentinel. When applied to the armor, it gave the impression of a less opaque layer of paint. Following this, some pure Tamiya XF2 was sprayed onto the model. Like before, it was heavily thinned down with Tamiya thinners, and I tried to keep the application blotchy and uneven. This was intended to represent a rough application of whitewash in the field. Once again, this was applied over the whole Sentinel, but particularly focus was applied towards the upper edges and surfaces. With the whitewashing complete, the next step was to remove it from the areas you'd expect wear and tear to occur. The previously applied worn effects made this a very simple task. By taking a damp brush and brushing it over the desired area, it would loosen small flecks of the paint by dissolving the worn effects layer beneath. From here, a drier and more rigid brush could be used to remove the paint, revealing flecks of the original olive green base coat. This wear and tear was focused primarily around areas that would see movement, foot traffic, or battle damage, around the hatches and doors for example. It's entirely up to you how far you go with this, but try not to go overboard. The final model should still look mostly whitewashed, with the damage there just to add a little flavor and detail. With the whitewashing completed, the whole model was given another coat of varnish. This would create a barrier that would prevent the subsequent layers of paint from reactivating the worn effects and preventing unintentional tripping. 
The problem with most transfer sheets is that the markings are often white, which is fine if your armor color is green, but when you have a whitewashed tank, they're not going to show up. So, to remedy this, one of the transfers was carefully cut out using a scalpel, making sure to follow the edge of the marking as carefully as possible. Once the number had been cut out, the surrounding area was also cut away from the sheet, leaving me with a stencil. This stencil was placed onto the surface of the tank and held in place with some masking tape, which also served to protect the surrounding area from overspray. With the stencil firmly in place, a few diluted layers of Demon Red from the Tooth and Coats range were sprayed over the top. After the paint had been given a chance to dry, the stencil was removed, revealing the marking beneath. To help blend this in a little, some of the thinned paint mix was applied in vertical streaks to give the impression of spray paint runoff. The next areas to tackle were the few parts of the model that weren't the actual Sentinel, which mainly included the pilot and the stowage items. Each of these areas were tackled with a regular brush and followed a base coat, mid-tone highlight process and used paints from the two thin coats range. The first details to paint were the khaki areas, which included the fatigues of the pilot as well as the fabric roll. First of all, these were painted all over with a base coat of Dust Bowl. A couple of layers were applied here just to achieve a decent coverage. After this, some Dragon Fang was used as a mid-tone. This essentially means that those surfaces that faced upwards were covered, whereas the recessed areas were untouched. Finally, a highlight of Skeleton Legion was painted onto just the edges. This is the lightest paint of the three and so helps to create a greater degree of contrast against the mid-tones and the shadows, helping to add depth and volume to the model. Following the same steps as before, the pilot's leather areas and the orc skulls were the next to be painted. First with a base coat of Scorched Earth, followed by a mid-tone of Ancient Forest, and then finally an edge highlight of Wasteland Brown. For the exposed skin of the face, Barbarian Brawn was the first coat. Next was a mid-tone of Dwarven Skin before picking out the details with some Elven Skin. However, in order to get the appearance of a cold environment, some Blood Angel's red contrast paint was heavily diluted and laid across the pilot's cheek and nose. This subtle red tone just helped to sell the model was within a frozen climate. The flak armor of the pilot, the fur lining of the Yushanka and the vehicle's vision ports were all giving a starting coat of Doom Death Black. This was built upon with a little dungeon stone grey, but rather than applying it as a regular mid-tone across the armor, it was instead used as a highlight. From here, the final highlight of Wizard Grey was applied. The last area of color to block out was the Yushanka's fabric. This was first painted with some of Tamiya's olive green. For the mid-tone, this was created by mixing some buff into the olive green in much the same way as we did earlier. However, due to a lack of sharper edges, the highlight wasn't required for this particular step. With all of the base coats complete, the model was ready for the more weathering. But first, everything needed yet another varnish. This time around, some gloss varnish was chosen. Gloss varnish creates a smoother surface that allows things like washers and filters to flow much more smoothly and find their way into those recessed areas. As this model had been painted in a winter scheme, it made the most sense to weather it with some winter streaking grime. This was applied from the pot and painted directly into the recesses and around the chipping. This has a slightly greenish hue, so it essentially gives the impression that some of the white has faded or has been washed away whilst also adding a bit of grimdark grime to the model. Now, this is an enamel-based paint, so you can't just thin it with water. Instead, you need thinners. This might seem odd if you're used to acrylic paint, but it does allow you to easily adjust the paint once it's been applied. By using a clean brush that's been dipped in thinners, you can clean up and move the pigment around until you're happy with the result. Following this, some regular streaking grime was used. This is much like the winter grime, but has a brown hue, making it perfect for representing the buildup of oil, mud, and general dirt. It's great for darkening down the deepest recesses even further, and when diluted with thinners, makes for an excellent wash over the pilot and the stowage items, helping to blend them into the weathered and dirty appearance of the vehicle's armor. The final weathering effect to use was rust streaks. This was used much more sparingly, and its use was limited to small flecks and spots. 
These patches of rust gave the impression of the areas where paint had been worn down to bare metal, allowing rust to form up through the paint. By this point, the weathering had dulled down the whitewash considerably. It seemed a little too dark in places. So, to fix this, another product from AK was used, washable white. This seems like your regular white paint, but once applied, it can be readjusted with a little water. This makes it fantastic for blending. By applying small spots of this paint around the Sentinel's armor, I could bring back the intensity of the white in some areas while still having enough control over the paint to retain the chipping and streaks of grime. With that final layer of washable white complete, the Sentinel itself was almost finished. All it needed was a final coat of matte varnish in order to seal in those last few layers of paint and remove that glossiness left behind by the earlier varnish. But I wasn't quite done with the model just yet. The base still needed attention, and naturally, the base needed to represent the snowy environment that the Valhallans exceed in. The first step in this was to apply some of AK's wet ground. This is a thick textured paste that can be applied directly to the base in order to create the basis of a snowy climate. Not only does it create an excellent starting color, but it also helps to add a little topography and surface variation. With the ground in place, the snow could be built upon it, and this would be done in a series of layers. The first of these would represent the snow that had melted away slightly and had frozen once again, leaving behind cloudy sheets of ice. This effect was created by mixing up a few products from AK Interactive. Roughly even amounts of snow sprinkles, snow micro balloons, and clear water were mixed together to create a paste. The sprinkles creates the cloudy effect, the micro balloons add texture, and the clear water helps to create a more translucent finish without losing the viscosity. This mixture was applied across the base, but in a few areas in the middle were left untouched. I wanted that muddy ground to still show through and give the effect of footfall or vehicles churning up and melting the snow in some areas, creating a rough path through the snow. From here, some clear water on its own was poured into those recesses in the muddy areas before being spread around a little into the smaller dips. Once dried, this will give the impressions of puddles of ice forming within the road. To build up the snow along the sides of the base, some of AK's snow was used. Again, this is a texture paste, meaning it can be applied quite thickly in order to build up the appearance of snow piles. Once applied, the paste can also be blended into surrounding terrain by using a slightly damp brush. This just helps to create something that looks to have formed naturally. However, on its own, AK Snow doesn't quite have that powdery snow effect. So, if this is something you want to create, then sprinkling over some of the micro balloons whilst the paste is still wet will allow you to create a more realistic looking snow. The only thing left to do now was to take a little dark brown paint and heavily thin it down with some water. This extremely thin mixture could be applied to the edges of the snow piles, just where they touch the muddy patches. The brown paint will slightly stain the snow and make it look as though muddy water has been splashed across it as the machines and infantry have passed by. And with that, the model was completed. And here we have the finished Valhallen Ice Warrior Armored Sentinel. While the kit bashing and conversion work was fairly light on this particular model, I think that it's always good to show what you can achieve without breaking the bank. With the exception of the orc skulls and the handle, this whole model can be built using spare parts from the Cadia Stands box set. If you enjoyed this guide and would like to see me tackle more Astra Militarum, please do let me know in the comments below. Also, leave me your suggestions for which regiments and units you'd most like to see. As always, I'll include all the paints used in the description, along with some of my affiliates links that you can use to help support my work. Now, before I go, let me say a big thank you to the ever wonderful patrons who keep this channel going, especially my expert tier and above supporters, who are Jack Ewan, Jonathan Hart, Tim, Brushlick and Nim, Daniel Dowling, Jesse Smith, Joachim Falk, Casper Limborg, Morgan, Mr. Grimm, Pale Juice, Swedsman, and the Googles. 
If you're interested in supporting me too, you can find a link to my Patreon below, where supporters can get ad-free access to my videos, sneak peeks, a private Discord channel, and exclusive merchandise. Plus, you'll be helping me out in the process. So until next time, thanks for watching, and goodbye.